Alright, let's dig in. We're going to be short today. <laughs> Whatever. And uh, I always say that because I feel better when I say it, but I know it doesn't mean that much. But, uh, and, and Jordan, thank you for playing it there. Did you notice the shirt yes. he was wearing? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, give it up. Go ahead. Read all through the Old Testament. 
and we see them. We see when Jesus shows up, he sees some things that are not in order in, in the house of prayer, in the temple area, and Jesus gets upset with that, and he judges them, he, and he runs them out because of their actions of selling those things and betraying and also being scam artists in the temple area. And the one thing that I've noticed in our society that, that there seems to be this, this movement of morality. I mentioned that a couple of weeks ago. And in that movement of morality, there's some things and some standards that are just kind of changing. Our value system is not the same value system we had 30, 40, 50 years ago. You, you know what I'm talking about? Okay. And so in that, I, I, I found, as I began to think about that, I, I noticed this, this trend that's out there. It's called the freedom of choice. You know? This pro-choice, if you would, or this freedom of choice. Now, I believe all of us have a freedom of choice, don't we? Amen. But the next step to that is there are consequences and they are conditioned to those free choices, right? You know, if you drive too fast, it's a freedom to drive fast, isn't it? What's going to happen to you? Probably. Maybe you hurt yourself, hurt somebody else, or, or get a ticket, you know? And then all of a sudden we see those changes. So we do have the freedom of choice. But, but what is lacking here is the value system or the standard that we have and the, the results of consequences are. And so today's thought is, and how this is changing is, is that you have freedom of choice. And what is right for you may not be right for me, but because you have this freedom of choice and this liberality to do whatever you want to, then it's okay for you to do it. It's right. And so we kind of lost this this, this connection here with, with standards and values. And we bought into this with just kind of turning our, our eyes away from that and, and not speaking truth. Now let me tell you, as Christians, with love, not judgment, we're to speak truth. Amen? Amen. We're called to do that. And so it kind of puts us in a, in a particular position. I like what... Uh, uh, Thoreau said, uh, what's that thing? Thoreau? Thoreau? Thoreau. Well, it's not even him. It's, it's uh, Hawthorne. So it's, it's, <laughs> <laughs> Who wrote the Scarlet Letter? Help me out with it. Huh? Hawthorne. See, I'm just taking, checking my life. I'm not fun. Terrible. <laughs> Hawthorne said this. He said that a pure hand does not need a glove to cover it up. So often, there's so many cover-ups in there. It's what can we get away with without being exposed. Lord, help us to have a sense of value about us as Christians. What we're called to do. Now, we're going to dive into this word because I believe Joseph is a great example of character. A man of godly character. And we're going to look at his life and then we're going to understand how did, he, how did he display that? There's something unique about this man. I don't think he was born that way because trust me, raising eight children... All of my children knew how to do wrong. You know what I mean? Sorry, guys. But, but, but you don't teach children to do wrong. You teach children to do what? Right. Exactly. And so how did, how did Joseph, did he just catch this? Did he just kind of know this? Was this a part of him? Or what was the determining factor in his life that he was a godly man? He displayed godly character. And we're going to dive into this right here. Father, we ask you for teaching. For teachable spirit in this place. That we would understand this. Thank you for men that are here. Bless them to them. Speak to their hearts. Thank you for the ladies and the women that are here today. Bless them also. And bless the word of God that is spoken and taught in this place. In Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. There are two things I want, to, I want to just kind of mention real quick about Joseph that I've seen. Now, you all know who Joseph is, don't you? Everybody know who Joseph is? No? Okay, I won't. I don't, Embarrassing, I don't know who Joseph is. Joseph is this uh, kid that was slow, uh, sold into slavery by his brothers. He got a raw deal just because he was kind of the favorite of his father and had this neat jacket that he wore around and displayed apparently, maybe in pridefulness or whatever, but he wore it a lot. And the brothers got kind of tired of this and so they, they seized him and, and they threw him in a well and then they decided how are we going to get rid of him. They sat around and they saw these. These gypsies come by and they sold him into slavery. And he ends up uh, in Egypt as a slave. Not a good deal, right? You know, by a childhood, right? But, but he's dealing with this process. And so what we're going to be looking at, at is two attributes and two characters of a godly man that I see. The first one is integrity. Say that word with me. Integrity. All right? 
me give you a working definition. This is uh, Webster's definition of integrity. First of all is this. It's steadfast adherence to a strict moral and ethical code. Second off, the definition of integrity is the state of being unimpaired, soundness, a sense of soundness about them, just a solidified nature about themselves, not wishy-washy, but, but someone who would speak, and someone who, when they speak, it's, it's sound advice, it's, it, it's true, it's solid, you can depend on it. And thirdly, a quality or condition of being whole or undivided, completeness. Now, as I said, you know, what happened to, to Joseph here, we're not going to read that lengthy uh, uh, scripture verse there, but let me just tell you what's happened. So he's, he's been sold into slavery, and they get to Egypt, and he's sold again, and he's bought by Potiphar. <coughs> Potiphar's a, a, a very wealthy, wealthy uh, man in Egypt. He's, uh, he, uh, he's well known, he's well versed, he's wealthy, he buys him. And so Joseph begins to display this sense of character that is noted by his master. And so he kind of works his way up. And finally it says in the Bible, in scripture verse, that it says, Potter became, uh, I mean, uh, Joseph became this, this individual who, who became the, uh, the one who made all the decisions. So much that Potter, he didn't care about anything except what to eat, when, what time to go to bed. And that was basically his only needs because Joseph took over all of his household. So there's something about Joseph that we can know here. Something about maybe his, his, some of his personal work ethics. Apparently he got up early, went to bed late, he took care of business. There's a sense of, of organization about him, I get that. But the greatest thing that I see him is integrity, because we see something that happened in his life. You know the story. Part of world's life saw that the Bible says that Joseph was very tall and handsome. And so she noticed him and she said, man. So one day as Joseph came by, she said, hey Joseph, I want you to sleep with me. Joseph said, I don't think so. We're not going there. Not only once did it happen, but the Bible says it happened twice. The next time she was very consistent that she grabbed his clothes, his jacket, his outer garments, the Bible says, and grabbed him and held on to him so much that Joseph had to just leave that outer garment and get out of there. And so because of maybe the rejection or because she got a call and maybe somebody oversaw that, she says, man, I'm in trouble now. My husband's going to find out. So she made up this lie and said, well, hey, Joseph came in to me and started taking off his clothes and approached me on this. I had nothing to do with it. She basically lied and she told those that were there, the servants, and then she told her husband and her servant came to Joseph and said, I can't believe you do something like that. He threw him into jail. Another bad deal, right? Not a good way to end up, right? Being honest, man of integrity, of standards, and yet, didn't turn out the way that he thought. Well, the key verse is in verse 9. Joe, just, I don't know why I got that scripture. Go to verse 9. I kind of told the story. Can you do verse 9 here? This is the key thing that what Joseph said. We're going to kind of dive into this about this integrity thing. You have a Bible? Somebody read verse 9 to it. Brandon, back there, you have that. Would you read verse 9? This is Joseph talking about the No, 39. I'm already 39. I'm sorry. Genesis 39. Verse 9. There it is. Let me read this too. Thanks, Brenda. He is not greater in this house than I am nor that he's kept back anything from me except you. Because you are his wife. Here it is. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin? Against God. Notice the integrity of that. The first part of this, I thought that was kind of interesting. How can I do, how, how can I do this, this, this great wicked thing? Now how, how did Joseph perceive this? You must understand, he, he lived in Egypt. There's a sense of, uh, Egyptians, they didn't have any rules about who you slept with, who you didn't sleep with. But he had this sense of integrity about him. Then he says, how can I do this, this great wicked thing? Something that was in Joseph's heart that made him stop. He made himself check this motive and, and check this situation out. And he said, how can I do such a, a great and evil thing? There was something, I think, in Joseph's heart that, that there was a kind of a check system there that stopped him from pursuing this thing that probably he could have got away with. And maybe not even condemned in that society. 
How did he do that? See, I think there's something in, in his heart. Because when something is in your heart, doesn't it come out? The Bible says our heart is, uh, you know, we, we deceive ourselves. Even our heart, we don't really want to know. But God knows our heart. He sees that. And usually what's in our heart usually eventually comes out. So if it's in there, but, but notice what he is. He said, this is a wicked thing that I would do. And so something happens in his heart. Maybe nobody else was around would have caught him. But because of the integrity and knowing that it was a wicked thing, he just stops himself and says, wait a minute, my heart's not in this. My heart's not a part of this. I'm not going to do this. Can I get that? Okay. Notice the next part he says. How can I do such a wicked thing? Then how can I do this and sin against God. See, not only did it was a check in his spirit and his heart, but it was also said, look, I'm going to stand before God one of these days. And I'm going to be judged according to God. And Job, he, he talks about this. He said, you know, do, do we not understand the conditions of the integrity of our heart? Because that is our hope in the future. And what Job is mentioning there, he's talking about that one of these days we're going to stand before God. And my hope is that when I stand before God, I'm not going to be condemned, but I'm going to be complimented by God. That I'm not going to be judged by Him, but I'm going to be rewarded by Him. That is my hope. And why? Because when I fall for something else, that I would have to have accountability. So I must have integrity in my heart, because my hope is when I stand before God one of these days, that He's not going to condemn me, but He's going to compliment me. Well done, good and faithful sermon. Do you hear that? And so Joseph gets this idea that it's not a temporary relief and satisfaction, but it's a moment of hope that he would stand before God himself and be just. So he says, it is a wicked thing that I would do, but also how can I, how can I sin against my God? <laughs> See, integrity must be something that is inside of you, not just a balance outside of maybe getting caught or maybe not, but integrity is in those quiet moments when no one else is around what is in your heart? What is in your heart? So how do we get integrity? How do we kind of check this? Because I think every one of us in this room, no hands, but we probably say, well, would you want some more integrity in your life? Most of us say, yeah. Some of us may say, would you want to be a man or a woman of integrity? Would, would you want that compliment about you? Uh, Brooks and Brothers Race or in this church, would you want that about you? Most of us would say, yes, I would like to be a man and a woman of integrity. But how do I do this? Let me throw out a couple things for you. First of all, you've got to ask God to test your heart. You have to ask God to test your heart. Here's Joseph in this situation. Do you think this is a test? This means yes, do this. So y'all are right. Very good. good answer. Do you think this was not a test? To whom much is given, much is required. And so, you know, you, you yeah. get this process here. We see the end of Joseph's life, and we say, wow. What a great guy he was. But there is a process to get there. You understand that? We don't like that process, but there's a testing that happens there that God really tests us. And so this process is, in fact, in Psalms it says, Test me and try me, O oh God, to see if there's anything in my heart. And so there's this process of testing. So here's, if you want more integrity in your life, or you want to be a man or a woman of integrity, then... Then, then ask God to test your heart to see if there's anything in there. Because He'll expose it to you every time, right? That's why we don't really like hard heart sermons because all of a sudden it puts our heart which is exposed. We like these funny, little, you know, quick little brief talks in church. Sometimes we shy away from true gospel because it always exposes our heart. Why? God's always after your heart, isn't be pure, be whole, to be a man or woman of integrity, you must ask God to test your heart. The second thing that I'd say to this, you've got to study to know what is true. You know what I'm saying? If you depend on the world to teach you what's true, guess what? You're going to be lied to, right? You must study the Word of God to know what is true. That's right. There's a lot of words in the Bible that says uprightness, there's truth, there's knowledge. All speak to this word integrity. And you must study your, and to, to know this. And when I was a youth pastor, uh, I, gave, uh, I gave all the graduating seniors a Bible. And I wrote 
uh, 2 Timothy 3.16 that says, Study to show thyself approval, a workman unto God that needs not to be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of God. That's what I wrote in every one of those Bibles. So that they would study to know what is right. That they would not depend on the world to show them what's right because the world will lie to them. Or even their own intuition. Or their own sense of morality. Because what is right is found in the Word of God. And the Word of God will not steer us right. So if you want integrity, ask this. Lord, test my heart to see if there's anything that is dark. And second of all, study the Word of God that you'll know what is true. Amen? Amen. Second of all, forgiving spirit. So we see two characteristics of Joseph. First of all, he's got this, this high integrity. And the second thing that is very obvious and well noted is a forgiving spirit. Let me give a definition of forgiving or forgiveness or to forgive. The definition is this, to excuse a fault or offense, to pardon someone, to renounce anger or resentment against, to absolve from payment of, to accord or to resolve. Let's look at this. Genesis chapter 45, verses 4 through 8. I'm praying if you'd read that for us. We're going to look at this story and understand how Joseph gives this display of forgiveness. Go ahead. So Joseph said to his brothers, Come near to me, please. And they came near. And he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to, to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years. And there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth, and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it is not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me father to Pharaoh, and Lord of all his house, and ruler over all the land of Egypt. You know the story very well. And we'll learn a little bit more about that process to get there. But now, now Joseph is, is, is the prime minister, okay, if you would, of all of Egypt. Here he is. In, last time we just looked at him, he's in jail, right? I'll tell you about that process in a minute. But now he's the prime minister under Pharaoh, who rules over everything. He's the prime minister. And the brothers who what? Betrayed him, sold him into slavery. Lied to the Father. Now they're standing before them. And Joseph can do whatever he wants to do because he's the prime minister. You get the story? Not looking good for the brothers, is it? And yet we see this forgiveness that we just read. How in the world did he do that? I mean, anybody have or at odds with their brother or sister right now? Reunion. You know what I'm saying? I doubt if any of them did what they did to Joseph. You know, <laughs> you know? I mean, it's horrific. This is an unbelievable situation. And Joseph looks at them and he gives his forgiveness. You know what I think? I think he just had this forgiving spirit. He just loved everybody. And everything was great in his life. It was easy to forgive. You think so? Absolutely not. So often we look at this and we go, well, that's just Joseph. Isn't he a wonderful guy? And we just kind of fluff him off. And, and, and I want to talk, I, I preach on forgiving spirit, but I'm going to take a different approach today. Okay? So hang on. I want to show you something that's a key element in Joseph's life that, that helps with a forgiving spirit. Are you, are you interested in that? Anybody? Anybody interested? Yeah. Okay. So five of y'all, the rest of y'all can leave, okay? <laughs> Seriously. Here it is. Throw that next to the key. I like this word. The secret of just ability to forgive was related to his view of God's will to allow injustice and misfortune. That's a different twist, isn't it? Read that again. Kind of let that absorb. Come on, read it again. That's why we got these screens up there for y'all to read, okay? So read the screen. His ability, his desire, was not a personal thing, an attribute. He was just full of love. Wasn't that at all? It wasn't really necessarily God told him, but it was his ability to forgive because 
He understood the will of God to allow injustice and these misgivings and these things that happened in his life. Now think about it. Joseph. He had a, a chance to look and understood that God had allowed him to be sold into same slavery. Did you notice what he said there? He said, God put me in this position so that I could rescue my family and all of the household of Israel. See, it was a bigger picture for him to be put in this position years, years later down the road so that he was there with a forgiving spirit because he understood the will of God was greater than any bitterness or anger that he could ever harbor against. God placed him in that position at that appointed time in that position to give life to the children of Israel. And that was the greater preacher. Do you understand that? So when Joseph looked, he says, I thank you. But this process brought me to this place that I can give them grain so they can even live or else they would die without me in this position. Also, when the injustice of Potiphar's life. I mean, I mean, here's a guy that said, no, 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 I will not have sex with you. No, absolutely not. And then he's thrown into jail. Is that fair or not? I don't think so. So he's in jail during that time. And, and, and think about this. I'm thinking about, you know, if you're in jail, you got a lot of time to think and harbor resentment, you know. I, I, I love these shows that talk about when they go into jail cell and, and they interview these guys and they're always blaming somebody. Well, my mother, you know. Well, my dad, or, or this guy over here, or I'm innocent officer. That was, you know what I'm saying? You hear what I'm saying? Everybody blames one another. But, but he's got a lot of time to think about this, about the injustice, and him doing something right and, and, and crying out to God, I did this right, and yet he's in jail. And yet, and during this process, he meets this cupbearer. For the for the framework. And he interprets these dreams, and in this process of dreams, the cupbearer goes to Pharaoh and he tells, I think what the dream is, and he, and he tells this, and, 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 and the cupbearer says, I won't forget you, Joseph, when you're Joe, because I, I, I'm going to be high ranking now, the cupbearer. And in the process, and guess what? The cupbearer didn't follow through with his promise. And Joseph is still left there. He did a good thing with interpreting dreams. Cupbearer is restored back into his position of nobility and all these things. And then Joseph is still, still, still in the prison cell. Do you think bitterness or anger might have just kind of crept up occasionally? <laughs> Maybe. And so, then the final thing, you know, I mean, here's all these things that are happening and he forgets about it. But here's the point. All these circumstances were bad events. Could have brought bitterness and anger and resentment and and withdraw from God. Say, God, I'm out. I'm out. Man, I try to do right. I try to do the right thing. And every time, look, I'm in prison now. Just because I did something right. I interpreted dreams. I, I, I said no. I, I, was just, I was just bringing food to my brothers. And every time I do something good, something bad happens. Good man, good. You ever meet people in, around the community just say, you know what, I'm angry at God because... And they tell this story. Or I'm angry with the church because the church member did so and such. Yeah. Maybe we brought that into this fellowship in today, bitterness and anger and just some resentment. But all these all these things that, that, that could have been, here's the thing that I see about Joseph that is so key in a forgiving spirit. He said, God, do you allow? He sees this bigger picture. God, do you allow all these things? And I'm not sure Joseph understood all these things in the process. You understand what me? Sometimes we don't get the process, and we, we it's a process that you know. And yet, when we look back, occasionally in the process, over, we look back and say, "Oh, there you are, God." That's what I see. What you're doing in my life. Didn't understand it then, but now I do. And so, in this process, Joseph comes to this acclamation that says, "God, you know, all these things happened to me, but..." Lord, you allowed this in your will, and because I'm in your will, and because you allowed it, then how can I ever hold any of these responsible? I forgive them. I'm not bitter. I'm rejoicing. He forgave others. He did not bear grudges. Because he saw God's will greater than those arguments. I heard this one time. I think it's anonymous. I don't know who said this. He said, 
just because, no, I said, you do not have to attend all the arguments you're invited to. Yeah. That's pretty good, isn't it? You don't have to show up for that. And Joseph did. Did he have a right to argue and be mad and be angry and press? That's my right, your body. Did he have an argument? Did he? Yes. With God? Absolutely. With man? Absolutely. He could argue and he fought and wrestled and said, no, no, no. But he didn't. He just forget. <coughs> because God was preparing for this final test. The ones that brought him to that place, his own brothers. How did he have this forgiving spirit? I'll tell you. He knew God's will allowed him, so he had this forgiving spirit. Several years ago, I don't know if you know the story or not, probably you do. Uh, Pope uh, John Paul. Do you remember when he was shot and the assassin came and tried to take him out? Uh, uh, A G C A. A K. That's his last name, this guy. He did this. Two years after that, on Christmas Day, uh, A K was in uh, a Roman cell. And the Pope came to visit him on Christmas Day, two years after this. And uh, of course, all the news media were trying to get the inside scoop, and probably extra was there, <laughs> and all these uh, fluky television shows that we had. Anyway, and, and they were, uh, no one was allowed in the cell, and they had a conversation for 20, 30 minutes. And when when the Pope came in, said, "What do you say?" He says, "He said I I have forgiven and pardoned my brother. I don't know about you, but if somebody shot me on Christmas Day, I don't." I think I'd do my grandkids opening gifts and you know celebrating and you know things like that. But but here, the Pope. And you, you know whatever you think of him, it doesn't really matter at this point. I don't really care. But I'm I'm talking about a, an attribute that displays forgiveness. And in that, what we're to be about? How often can we touch people's lives and we just offer forgiveness? I was visiting. I, I, I did a wedding last night and I was sitting there and one of the bridesmaids came and. We're just talking, and she said, oh, you know, uh, uh, she said some things anyway. And, and she said, I've been married for one month. <laughs> I said, one month? I said, how's that going? <laughs> and she said, oh, my goodness. <laughs> I said, what's that mean? She said, man, I didn't know I'd have to forgive so much after one month. <laughs> it's a process. And look, we talk for a lot. Forgiveness. So often that is so human, isn't it? And ultimately, what does it really matter? To hold and to harbor. It only controls yourself, doesn't it? Joseph has his forgiving spirit because why? He says, Lord, your will allows all these things in my life to get me to this point. So I'm okay with that. Do you hear that? Alright. How did Joseph, here's the question. How did Joseph live a life of integrity and maintain a forgiving spirit? As I said earlier, I, I really believe it just what he just had. I don't believe that. I really believe it was this process because we've looked at all these stories. One after these are horrific stories that would crush any one of us in this room. But Joseph passes these test after test after test. How did how did he get to this place of a, a forgiving spirit and also this integrity? Two things, and then we're through. Here it is. Here's the here's what I I think is true in this story. First of all, it says that Joseph demonstrated this total trust in God. He started off pretty good in life. He had his dad's faith. He was the favorite. I mean, it all started off pretty well in Joseph's life. Then the brothers betrayed him. He sold him to slavery. It just gets worse and worse and worse. And then he works his way up and then he goes right back down. He works his way up and he works his way back down. Just kind of this roller coaster ride. You kind of hear that? And we see this in his life. And, 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 and he interprets dreams and, and yet he still forgot. It. Here it is. Here's the point that I want to make. Joseph demonstrated his total trust. Here it is. In difficult circumstances and trials, Joseph did not complain or give up and continued to put his faith and trust in God. He didn't quit. He stayed in the battle. Anybody need to hear that this morning? The battle, I don't mean you keep fighting. You just stay in the task that God is doing in your life. Don't quit. Don't give up. Don't say,
said, well, it's not working out. You know, nobody likes me. You know, everybody hates me. Everybody's against me. You know, can't do this, can't do that. You know, whatever your circumstance is, just apply this principle right now. And here's what I see in Joseph's life that, that, that helped him with this forgiving spirit and, 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 a, and a heart of integrity is this, is that in difficult circumstances of trials, he did not complain, he didn't give up, but he continued to put his faith and his trust in God. He continued his fight. It's the truth. It? It's the truth. The second thing. In good times, do not forget nor to our, our neglect to maintain your faith and trust in God. You see, there are a lot of good moments in, in, in Joseph's life. He was up at the top of the, he was top of the food chain, you know. And yet, and during those times, in fact, uh, Pharaoh in Genesis uh, chapter 51, 51, Pharaoh makes a notation. They said, man, Joseph, you've really got together. In fact, I see your faith in God, and your God is with you. Now, here's a pagan emperor ruler, and he makes this connotation of Joseph's life. Even in good times, listen, even in good times, don't forget your faith and maintain your faith. Since it's easy, there are no atheists in Fox Hunt, you heard the expression, you know, when times are trouble, but God help me. But in good times, don't forget. Last Sunday we looked at that out the lake. We're to give thanksgiving and be thankful for all the blessings that God has given. And never, never forget the goodness of the Lord. The same thing that I noticed is this. Joseph was focused and faithful to God's promises. He was focused there. I think that's a good word for us today. In, in, in understanding that we want to be a man or a woman of integrity, that each of us would want to display this forgiving spirit that we must understand that we must be focused to the faithfulness of God's Promises. You know, often I've heard this sermon used as a as a menu or as a or as a venue of, of corporate success. You know, look if you're if, you know if you'll just be faithful, you know, the God's going to bless you, and and, and 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 you know, just just it's kind of a menu or a way of, of success in the corporate world. And, and here's what I think is, is is a little bit more meaty than just that statement, because I think there is that that we're faithful to God. You know, and the little things that he's faithful later on. And I get that, that God desires to bless us. I get all that. But, but more than that, here's what, I want to, here's what I want to say. Joseph was so focused on God's promises. Whether he had a lot or whether he was in a prison cell, whether he was the prime minister or, or whether he was locked up in chains with all these renegades. There was something that kept him focused, and I believe it was God's promises. That he said, God... I trust you more than I trust myself. I trust you more than the hurt that I have, the betrayal that I have, and my feelings of betrayal and mistrust. I trust you greater, and I'm going to depend on the promises and focus on the promises that you have greater than my circumstances. Here it is. Despite life's twist and <coughs> achievements and losses, God's plans and promises are true and eternal. In Genesis chapter 50, verse 24 through 26, we see uh, this deathbed experience, this deathbed saying from Joseph. Notice what it said here. And Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die, but God will visit you, bring you up out of this land, to the land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. What's he talking about there? The land of milk and honey, right? The promises. Okay, God promised them. Okay. Verse 25, then Joseph made the son of Israel swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry my bones from here. In other words, I will be buried in, you know, in Israel, in, in the land of the promises of God. You see, I, I thought about that, and I thought about, you know, Joseph was so focused on the promises of God. Much greater than his circumstances, much greater than his dilemmas, much greater than prison time or success time. He was focused on the promises of God. And at the end of his life, here's what he says. Take my bones and bury me in the promise of God. Because God's going to fulfill his promises. That's what he's saying with his life. In Hebrews chapter 11, that is called the, uh, the, the, the chapter of the Hebrews. 
heroes of faith, right? You know that, Hebrews chapter 11. And you see all these lists of individuals down there and, and their great accomplishments and how they trusted God and all this. And then you come to Joseph. And it's a strange statement that's made there, Hebrews chapter 11. I think verse 24 is somewhere in there. Here it is. It doesn't talk about his achievements. It doesn't talk about prison time. It doesn't talk about his forgiving spirit that is, is well noted and well versed here. It doesn't talk about his acclamations and his success, about how well he was a manager of wealth and, and God raised him. I mean, he didn't talk about all those things. You know what he talks about? He talks about Joseph and his request of his bones being buried in the land of milk. That's kind of strange, isn't it? And I thought about that, and I thought, of all the heroes of faith, Joseph displays his faith, not in his circumstances, not in the conditions around him, but that he knew that God would do what he said he was going to do, and that one of these days, this, this, this green pastures of Egypt and all the wealth that he's experiencing is nothing to compare with the promises that God will fulfill, and that he is fully going to fulfill those promises to those who serve him and those who are called his children. And I thought about that. That is a hero of faith. No matter what you go through in life, that God's promises will never leave you, nor they will forsake you, that you can depend on that all the days of your life, even in the good times and the bad times. Billy Graham, in his autobiography, said this. He said, you know, I was offered movie deals and... Uh, uh, these television shows, you know, to speak on and, and to be a part of, to establish. She was even offered to, to be in a Christian university on his behalf, Billy Graham. And here's what he said in this autobiography that I think is so cool. He said this, even though these were great opportunities in this, there was a still small voice in me that said, I have been called to be an evangelist. And what God calls us to do, He is able to accomplish that. So I am an evangelist. I like that. Listen, whoever you are in this place, God gives us the promises. The promises of this is that I can have a forgiving spirit no matter what happens to me. I can only have a forgiving spirit if I totally trust Him. And depend that God use all these circumstances that looks bad to me and just kind of heartbroken. God can use these things for His glory and His honor. So why wouldn't I just forget it? Let it go and move on. The second thing, if I want to be a man of integrity, I must understand that it's a principle that's in my heart and then expose myself to say, God, try me and test me to see if there's anything and to always be open to study the Word of God to see what is true to be a man or woman of integrity. Today's Happy Father's Day. God bless you men for being a part of this fellowship. To roll your sleeves up and be what God has called you to be. And no matter what happens from this day to the day, to, unless God tears and raptures us up, because that's what I'm praying for, I'm going to let y'all. You know, not, not today because I want to have Father's Day, but tomorrow. <laughs> Preferably before April the 15th. But anyway, yeah, I get that, but, but until that dying day, until that dying day, serve the Lord. Do it with a forgiving spirit. Man of integrity. Be your word. Let your word be you. Stand on that. No matter what the circumstances are, always depending that God has this greater picture that we can't always see, but He always as followers of Christ, bring to His glory. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this, uh, this brief word of, of a man of integrity and a man of a forgiving spirit. A man who's truly a hero. Or you used him. I can't, I can't imagine the torment and the struggle he must have gone through. Days of being locked up. Years of being away from his family, his father who loved him. Okay. Lord, you take this seemingly bad childhood, this horrific adulthood, and you raise up a godly man. Lord, I thank you that you 
you're still able to do that. And you still desire to do that. I pray for men in this fellowship, every one of them, that they would dream men of integrity and men that display the forgiveness of Thank you that you're doing that and you continue to do that in this place. Father, we love you and we thank you so much as our Heavenly Father. We give you praise and glory for what you've done in our life and you continue to do in our life. I thank you for this moment of study and this moment of inspiration and scripture examination <coughs> that, Lord, your truth, your word will change us and we stand on your word and we trust you in all things, in all things.